At Bet365, we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. See for yourself when you sign up today and get $150 in bonus bets when you bet just $5. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Terms and conditions apply. The following podcast contains explicit language. Hide your children. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of April 8th, 2024. On this week's show, the athletic Chantel Jennings will join us to talk about all the storylines from South Carolina's scintillating win over Iowa and everything else from this year's women's NCAA tournament. We'll also discuss John Calipari's move to Arkansas. And we'll be joined by the publisher of Hunter Brook Media, Sam Koppelman, to talk about a new report on Phoenix Suns owner Matt Ishbia's mortgage company and how Hunter Brook is using investigative journalism to try to make money in the stock market. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm the author of the book The Queen and the host of an upcoming slow burn season on the rise of Fox News and how the left tried to fight back. Also in D.C. is Stefan Fatsis. He is the author of the book's Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside. Hello, Stefan. Hello, Josh. Our friend Joel Anderson is off this week, but we believe Joel is going to be back for our bonus episode for Slate Plus members. Usually those episodes are going to come out at the exact same time as our main episode. But this week, like last week, we're releasing the bonus on Tuesday, this time so we can talk about the men's national championship game between Purdue and UConn, in which a pair of large humans, Donovan Klingon and Zach Eady, will repeatedly ram into each other hopefully in an entertaining fashion. If you want to hear that bonus episode and you don't subscribe, there are two ways for you to get the whole hang up and listen experience every week. You can either subscribe right now by going to Apple Podcasts and clicking try free at the top of our show page, or you can visit slate.com forward slash hang up plus to get access wherever you listen. The Caitlin Clark College experience ended on Sunday where most rational basketball minds expected it to with the all-time NCAA scoring leader and her overmatched Iowa teammates falling to the sports juggernaut South Carolina. Here's ESPN's Ryan Rucco with the call of the final moments of the game. Perfection with a touch of sweet redemption. Undefeated South Carolina has won its third national championship. The Gamecocks 87-75 win capped a 38-0 season and was the second NCAA women's title in three years and third overall for South Carolina head coach Dawn Staley. Chantel Jennings of The Athletic was at the game in Cleveland, and she is here with us now. Hey, Chantel. Hey. You made it back. You must be tired, but we'll plow ahead. Caitlin Clark scored 30 points but took 28 shots and was understandably unable to single-handedly overcome South Carolina's depth, size, and strength. But before we get into the details of the game, Chantel, tell us what it was like to be at one of the most talked about and viewed women's sports events of all time. It's just been a really cool year, I think. To be covering the sport at this like specific moment feels really special. You know, I keep liking this, likening this to, you know, I haven't covered a Super Bowl or a World Series, sort of these other things that a lot of sports writers are like, oh, these are the things that you do. But this moment in women's basketball, how it's exploded in such a short period of time um, with sort of these singular stars that have pushed the game forward and um, how the NCAA has really been held accountable in in a way and forced to make changes like everything that's happened over the past three years and it just feels really special and I feel you know it adds more sort of weight to what I'm doing at times to make sure that you know I'm here I have a front row seat to this like massive shift in the sport and how it's seen and what's going on and so yeah I I think I tried to especially in this tournament just remind myself of that to like 
take a step back every game that I was at. I was at a game every round and just like appreciate what is going on. I followed Iowa the entire time. And so I was in Iowa City the first two rounds and then Albany and then Cleveland. But, you know, just to sort of step back and and look around and know that this is a sport that I've appreciated and loved for a long time and covered for the last few years. And that right now is just, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, if, you know, the NCAA will be long past existence by that point. But people will look back at this season and sort of everything since the bubble season as like, that was the moment. Like, I I truly do believe that. And so I'm just sort of in my uh, delirium of sleeplessness. I am still really thankful to sort of have had a front row seat to everything that's happened over the past few years. In terms of buzz and and star power on the court, you would probably rank South Carolina fourth or fifth in this tournament behind Iowa, LSU, maybe USC and, and UConn. And they were sort of a sideshow on the way to their own coronation in, in ways. And I wonder if you felt like, given the massive audience that Shirley tuned in on Sunday um, to watch women's basketball, to watch South Carolina, but a lot to watch Caitlin Clark, if, in fact, um, this was finally the chance for the country to recognize and understand how brilliant this team was, how brilliant their coach Don Staley is, and what a team it is, a, a team with different leading scorers, it seems like, every game, a team whose best players come off the bench uh, because they're freshmen, a team obviously with a star in Camila Cardoso, but that just comes at you in waves and with and with star power. Do you think that the country will finally appreciate, you know, what kind of what we have in South Carolina now? I hope so. I mean, this is a program that last year produced a first round WNBA draft pick who started like seven games total during her college career. Like that doesn't happen in other sports. Um, But you talk to the players who are at South Carolina, like every player in their nine player rotation, which like, let's just appreciate that. There's not many programs, especially in the era of the transfer portal, where you can go nine deep because players are antsy. They want to play every player in this rotation is top 25. All except one are top 15. And so these are players that would start at 349 other Division I programs, and they choose to be at South Carolina because of the track record that this program has. Whether you start and play 30 minutes a game, whether you come off the bench. Ashlyn Watkins came off the bench in the final four game and had 20 rebounds. Like The leading scorer in the national title game was a freshman who came off the bench. It it truly is, and I think part of you know the depth of this team is why they're so good. There's not sort of that star figure. Everything goes through Camila Cardoso on both ends of the floor, but because they have so many different weapons, you know, it's it's sort of the opposite of a Caitlin Clark type team where it's like you have the star and then there's everyone else. Like South Carolina is just everyone. Um, and that's what makes them so powerful and so dominant that on any given night, you close your eyes and just point to a player and that's going to be who leads them in scoring and close your eyes and point to another player and that might be who leads them in rebounding like it's very democratic on that team and scariest part is that the majority of this roster will be back next year unlike last year where they graduated you know every starter and this whole group was new and the player who had the most starts under their belt was Raven Johnson with three I believe like this is such a new team and now they have this under their belts and they're they're coming back and they will be even more dangerous heading into next season. And that is largely about Dawn Staley. I mean, the ability to recruit a wave and to get some through transfers, but to recruit a wave of the best players in the country, as you said, is more and more difficult in the NIL era. And the result of that, I think we saw at the beginning of the game on Sunday. Caitlin Clark came out and scored 18 points in the first quarter, the most anyone's ever scored in a quarter in a national championship game. And after that, it was like, okay, she did that. We'll figure out something, a way to stop her. We will throw different bodies at her. We will bring bring people off the bench to harass her and keep a hand in her face. And Clark went five for 20 over the rest of the game. 
I think also notably, you know, she didn't just go five for 20. She only finished with five assists. And so there have been games where, you know, her shooting is maybe not as impressive as as her typical highlight reel shooting nights. But then, you know, she records like 12 assists and, you know, her teammates are picking up 24 to 30 points off of her assists. And that just wasn't the case. Like South Carolina was getting in lanes um, and passing lanes. They were just like denying everything. They had truly a hand in her face, Raven or Brie, like four inches from her face Uh so that she really like could not see the passing lanes and not just get like a really open and clear view of what to do. It's a really free flowing offense that, that Iowa runs called the read and react. And It's a lot of like off ball cutting and passing and movement. And it was just South Carolina came out with the better game plan and they were the better team. And I think that was, you know, at the end of the night when Kate Martin and Caitlin came into the post game press conference, like they were clearly sad and disappointed. But I think they also are sort of mature enough and old enough to know, you know, even in that moment, like to give credit to South Carolina and understand like the better team won this game and they did what they could and that there is nothing to be ashamed about in what they have built at Iowa and what they've done this year. They've had an amazing season and they just didn't win the last 40 minutes. Yeah, Josh, I was just going to add to that, that even when Caitlin Clark made great passes, her teammates either failed to finish or were denied the ability to finish by South Carolina. Yeah, I would say that both about this game and about the kind of multi-year run that these teams are on and this sport is on, I I think everything has built uh, on itself and it's kind of culminated in this year's tournament, which as far as television interest, fan interest, everything just played out kind of perfectly. South Carolina, and you wrote about this, Chantel, was just so devastated by the loss to Iowa last year, in particular Raven Johnson, being kind of dismissively waved at by Caitlin Clark in last year's Final Four game. It would have been nice if she came out and shot well in this game, but she did play really good defense on Caitlin Clark, so she got some measure of redemption there. But, you know, Iowa got its revenge on LSU. South Carolina got its revenge on Iowa. So there is a sort of something kind of lovely about that, in a sense, but also this idea that if you watch the sport, you're going to be rewarded with these multi-year arcs that now we've gotten to know these players and we get to see them grow and evolve and have opportunities sort of like pro players, you know, typically do um, to get redemption against a rival and has just not been a thing that's happened in college and, you know, the last several decades. And the buildup to that, Chantel, for next year is that the newer storylines were eliminated kind of at the right time and fairly, but now we've got Juju Watkins who we're going to watch. And we've got the Paige Becker's redemption final season coming up. There's already reason to be excited for the 2024-25 season in women's college basketball. This is one of the things when I talk with coaches about the change in age rule for the WNBA, because currently with the WNBA CBA, you have to turn 22 in the year of the draft or be graduated from college. And and so players on the women's side don't leave early like they do on the men's side. When you talk about changing that rule so it maybe meets where the men are at or lessens the amount of time that women have to spend in college, one of the things that coaches really bring up is that you have these players in the women's game that get these followings and these these fan follow followings like imagine if Caitlin Clark who was a very good shooter as a freshman but people didn't know her as well because she hadn't had time to sort of build this following and this legacy at Iowa if she had gone to the WNBA at that point sort of how different women's college basketball would be right now and because of again those four-year players five some six Kate Martin Iowa (laughs) wing is a six-year player you have these recurring storylines and people can, you know, already sort of look forward to next year and and the redemption tour or the revenge tour or whatever it is and and look at these teams and you know who's going to be back. And, you know, I see the benefits to both both ways. And, you know, is Juju Watkins good enough to be in the WNBA right now? Like we can debate that fact, um, but she'll be in the Big Ten next year. And she'll be in a lot of those Caitlin Clark, Iowa time slots, I'm certain, on Fox and FS1. And it's, you know, those sort of renewing rivalries where for so long it was UConn and Tennessee that built 
this sport and sort of that rivalry. And right now you're seeing these with the increased viewership sort of that year to year change. Like Iowa LSU became a rivalry for right now and it might continue that way. And South Carolina, Iowa rivalry for right now and and South Carolina UConn is going to exist, but it's like, it's just a changing time in the sport for all of the reasons that we've talked about. We'll be back to talk some more with Chantel Jennings about Caitlin Clark in the WNBA and other women's basketball stories. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the more than 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase, every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. All right, let's start this segment with some words that Don Staley said after South Carolina's national championship victory. And I, I want to personally thank Caitlin Clark for lifting up our sport. Sh- she carried a she carried a heavy load for our sport, and it just is not going to stop here on the collegiate tour. But when she is the number one pick in the WNBA draft, she's gonna she's gonna lift that league up as well. So so Caitlin Clark, if you're out there, you are one of the goats of our games. That we appreciate you. Chantel, I think maybe that goat reference at the end was her walking back a statement that she had made um, about how to be the greatest of all time. You need to win a national title. And there was a lot of conversation. I don't know if you heard it in Cleveland about, oh, we're having a bunch of dumb debates about women's basketball. That must be about, you know, a sign that the sport has arrived. We're talking about legacies and we're talking about, you know, the conversation that was had at the end of the UConn-Iowa game. Did you feel yourself being uh, surrounded by dumb debates and did you enjoy it? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how many of the dumb debates I heard because... It was a lot of writing and a lot of work. And when I wasn't doing that, I was like sleeping. Um, (laughs) But I will say that this just in terms of like random people in my life talking to me about women's basketball that have never talked to me. I think that's where I sort of realized like, oh, the sport has arrived in a way like I see the, you know, the memes and there was like the Haley Van Van Lith meme during um, the LSU Iowa game earlier and sort of like the meme ability. I don't know if that's going to like become our gauge of what is or is not mainstream in America in 2024. Maybe it is. But for me, it's a lot of people who have never cared about women's sports before and know what I do for a living and just sort of think it's cool that I do something I enjoy, but are texting me about like random people. We had an Uber driver in Albany 
who like gave me the rundown of Colorado's roster. Some like random guy <laughs> named John where we get in the car and he's like, oh, what are you here for the tournament? I said, yeah, I'm where, you know, it was a few of us were like, oh, yeah, we're sports writers. And he was like, that Colorado team, man, like da, da, da. And I was like, Colorado <laughs> is the team that you're going to bring up right now. Like, you know, like Iowa and South Carolina are here, too, at LSU. And you're talking to me about Colorado. Just a big like, Frida Foreman fan. Yeah, it's he he was really impressed with uh Jalen Sherrod and and Arenette Vonley and I was just like, Wow, do you are you looking for a job? Is this an application? I don't think we're looking for a Colorado beat writer right now, but very cool. So I think it's just those interactions or, you know, I got in the elevator yesterday and, you know, there were two guys and I speak passable Spanish and they were talking in Spanish about like a box and one defense on Caitlin Clark and whether or not they thought Don Staley was going to, you know, use the box and one defense on Caitlin Clark in this game. And it was just like, it was really cool to just sort of be in these settings away from the arena where, yeah. you know, it just feels like everyone is talking about women's basketball. Yeah, for sure. On the Moving screen call, it was interesting to see that kind of conversation break out and be like a real on-court basketball discussion, not about the personalities, not about, oh, like record ratings and all that. Like this was like a hardcore discussion about you've got to call that. Oh, you shouldn't call that. Oh, that gets called every time. And the thing that I didn't see discussed, and I don't know if, if this thought occurred to you, Stefan, is how much television production can influence these discussions because in the yes. first replays that ESPN showed, they didn't show Aaliyah Edwards's feet. They only showed her upper body. And I think once you got on Twitter and saw all of these other replays where it was clear that her lower body was moving, there's still a question about they're moving screens all the time that are by definition not called. So I don't I don't really buy that you have to call that or that gets called every time. It's just not true. But it was Definitely very clear after seeing the replays that there wasn't that much gray area. It was a mo it was a moving screen, but I just feel like ESPN did a kind of they did a great job all weekend. But in that one isolated case, I didn't think they did a really good job showing viewers what had actually happened. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I felt initially it was like you saw her upper body and the, also it was the angle. It was the camera angle sort of from half court. So you're not seeing her straight on and you don't see the movement of her left elbow and arm coming out. And it was misleading and it informed not only the replays and the announcers in that moment, but it informed the post game commentary from the panels on ESPN and the conversations that the commentators, the, the women had about that play and all of the commentary was the ref made a mistake. And then as soon as you saw like a wide angle and saw how much she was moving, you realized that no, the ref actually made a great call and a brave call in that moment. I think an interesting note about that, which I actually covered the South Carolina NC State game for the athletics. So I was in the press room when all of this was happening and just watching on TV and sort of we were like three seconds behind. And so I'd hear the arena <laughs> roar and I'm like, this is either good or bad. And then three seconds later, I'd see it on TV. So I did not see this live. So I will acknowledge that. And I have not in the last 48 hours gone back to watch that um, replay. I will at some point this week once Take I sleep a little bit it. more. Yeah, I will take your guys' word. I did see the replays, obviously, on on Twitter and sort of once you got that other angle. But what's interesting about that play that my colleague Sabrina Merchant told me is that she noticed Gabby Marshall, after she got hit by another Aaliyah Edwards screen earlier in that quarter, go up to the ref and say, you know, she's she's moving on the screen every time. And I thought, you know, specifically in the national title game, because officiating was a conversation mm -hmm. that came out of that game a year ago, um, I was really watching how the veteran players – in the women's game this year overall, but, but especially in the final four, those players and like how they interact with officials and sort of understanding, you know, and you know, what do they say? Honey attracts more flies than vinegar. Is that That's the saying it. I'm running? I'm like no sleep right now, <laughs> but sort of going over and, and Gabby is really good at this sort of like going over and having a very calm conversation with officials and just sort of, you know, mentioning things. But I thought that was, um, you know, a veteran move by a fifth year player understanding that every single call matters in a game like this. So we mentioned Caitlin Clark, WNBA first pick overall, and she's going to be playing games for the Indiana Fever in like five weeks. Is that right? Yep. Um, That's how it works. 
it's a really incredibly fast turnaround for her and a real opportunity for for the league. I was saw that the Aces in, in Vegas, who have the biggest attendance, are moving preemptively their game with Indiana before Caitlin Clark has even been drafted to a larger arena. So I'm I'm curious what you think the effect is going to be on the league as a whole and how she's going to adjust. And there's also all this conversation with players like Diana Taurasi kind of talking shit about her, being like, it's going to be a rude awakening, et cetera, and so forth. Because of her three-point shooting skills, like that's something that translates, like because of her range. Like, I think that's why, you know, defensively she has some some miles that she needs to make up for sure. But offensively, like her three point shooting is something that I think we're going to see translate. I think her passing, um, it's not going to be as smooth of a transition simply because the defenders at the next level are so much better. But I think in terms of like the welcome to the WNBA moments, I remember Sue Bird talking about her first game out of UConn. You know, she's the number one pick in Seattle. And it was like whoever, I forget who they were playing, but whoever was defending her, the opposing coach was paying, was like, oh, I'll give you a hundred bucks for every time you pick Sue's pocket. And so it was just like relentless pressure. And it was sort of like Sue felt like every game there was sort of like this bounty of like, you know, how much can you pick on on Sue? And I think there is that thought about rookies. This is a league where it's really hard to make it as a rookie. There's fewer than 144 spots every year. And and to be able to make it as a rookie is very, very hard. And Caitlin is going to garner a lot of attention. And it's going to be an interesting year. I think I agree with Dawn where it, her impact is not going to just stay at the college level because people are going to travel to see her play. The Aces have moved their their game. I'm sure we might see other teams do the same as well to get to bigger venues so it's that like they messy. can make money as well. Yeah, it is. And it's I mean, we saw it like there are it's not just Iowa that was making money on sort of her success. Like every team in the Big Ten that sold out and sold more concessions and made more on parking, like all of these programs also made more money because of Caitlin Clark's influence. And you're going to see that in the WNBA, too, when she comes to play the Mystics or when she comes to play the Lynx, like the Lynx are retiring Maya Moore's uniform when Indiana comes, which was her favorite player. Like there's already this buzz and these things that are happening. And so I think we'll continue to see her impact. Is she going to be the exact same player at the next level immediately? No, because you can't do that um, because the players, again, especially the guards, it's a veteran league um, and the the defense is just so elite. But I think she's going to have her moments that really carry sort of this legend forward. And the financial impact that she's going to have, you mentioned on individual teams, but she's had this impact in college sports that aren't just the ratings are up a little bit. It's the value of this property is up by tens of millions of dollars annually, if not more in terms of her marketing capability, the fact that she arrived in the NIL era and is going to make $76,000 in her first season in her contract as the number one pick in the draft versus the millions that she's going to make in endorsement deals. And she's also going to have to make a decision about whether to play overseas or not the way that most or many players in the WNBA do. Um, If I'm the league, I assume that at this point they are making serious week-to-week, game-to-game plans for how to capitalize on Caitlin Clark, both in the individual markets, but also in the national rollout of the league this year. This is the biggest opportunity the WNBA has had in a very long time, isn't it, to reach the market that she was reaching in college? Yeah, and UConn coach Gino Oriama talked about that a little bit during one of his Final Four press conferences, that he really hopes, you know, not just with Caitlin, but with sort of all of these stars, that the WNBA markets its players better because they haven't done a good job of that in the past always. And um, we're seeing we're seeing more of it. I think there there are some WNBA draft commercials out with Arike Ogunbowale and Brianna Stewart that have sort of gotten rave reviews and sort of showing these sides of these players that are, you know, social and silly and and out there a little bit differently than how you've seen them. And so, but yeah, I think there is a huge opportunity here and it's on the WNBA to, to execute on it. The big story in men's 
college basketball before the national championship game as the John Calipari is reportedly leaving Kentucky for Arkansas. There had been kind of thoughts that given Kentucky's poor performance in uh, the tournament the last few years that um, the relationship could be on the way to a breakup, but this is still really surprising. And the thing that I find fascinating that connects this to women's basketball is that Calipari didn't adjust to the way that the sport is played these days. And the coach at Arkansas, who's now going to USC, Eric Musselman, he used the transfer portal. That's basically the entire way that Arkansas kind of came back to being relevant after a couple of decades of being off the, the map in men's basketball. Um, made a couple of elite eights by just bringing in transfer after transfer after transfer, whereas Calipari was still using the same high school recruit one and done kind of approach that had worked for him, had brought Kentucky a national championship with Anthony Davis in 2012 and led them to a bunch of Final Fours. But just in a sport now, and Calipari said this after they lost to Oakland, where they're playing a bunch of 24 and 25 year olds, it didn't necessarily work anymore, Stefan. And Arkansas is this combination, sort of like Texas A&M in football, where they have a lot of money because of Boosters ranging from like the Tyson chicken guy to the Walton family to Jerry, Jerry Jones. Jones. <laughs> They've got NIL up the wazoo. They have a desire to be really good. And you have a coach who I think wanted to be wanted. And so that leads to, to him going to, to Arkansas. And then I think the connection to women's basketball is Kentucky historically the best, most storied and most pressure of, of any program in the sport. And on the women's side, I think Tennessee um, is probably, you know, it, it predates UConn, but, um, you know, it's up there with UConn in terms of, of having that mantle. And they are going outside of, like, the Pat Summit family and the Pat Summit coaching tree for the first time since, you know, Summit's uh, retirement, hiring a, a coach from Marshall, Chantel, um, which somebody I hadn't ever heard of. Um, and so it, it was a, a surprise. Yeah, it was. Um... <laughs> someone I presume you had heard of, but that I hadn't heard of. Yeah, but, you know, this is someone who has, you know, exactly one more year of Division One coaching experience than anyone on this podcast. Like, it's um, definitely, you talk about sort of those programs, the Blue Bloods on the women's side and what Tennessee has meant to this sport, what its alumni have meant to this sport and how they've built this sport and and how it perceives itself that like that's the connection of Kentucky. They their like self-perception and the reality of the last few years is like so far out of alignment. Yeah. And I think the job that Kelly Harper had done, I was pretty surprised that they got rid of her because you know, it wasn't a great season, but I thought she had I thought she had one more year of runway, honestly, when you know, we started hearing rumblings that this was happening. Um, and in my mind, I thought that meant, you know, whatever big swing, you know, that's what I had written afterwards when I pointed out, you know, who they're going to go after. And, you know, I had I had said Carol Lawson is the big swing you go after here. She is someone who played for Pat Summit. She's in the Summit line. Um, she's a defensive coach. She's shown an ability to build at Duke already. She has experience in the NBA. Like this is someone whose resume just sort of makes so much sense at that program who just gets it right. Like there aren't a ton of programs in women's basketball where when you say like, oh, they get it. Like there's now like South Carolina, Stanford, Tennessee, UConn, like these programs where you think whoever takes the mantle of these programs just needs to get it. And I'm not saying necessarily that Kim doesn't get it. But it's not necessarily the obvious hire here, the big swing here where you say like, oh, well, yes, I guess that's why you get rid of Kelly Harper so you can hire Kara Lawson. Or I guess, yeah, you're going to fire Kelly Harper when she probably could have had another year here if you're able to hire Becky Hammond. Like there are certain hires where getting rid of Kelly makes a lot of sense. I don't think we've actually mentioned the name of the coach who's coming Kim, to Tennessee. Kim Caldwell. We just said Kim. Kim Caldwell. Kim Caldwell. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Kim Caldwell. No, not your fault. Yeah. Our, our fault. And, you know, and that's part of it, right? This is someone that basketball fans aren't going to know. She coached at Marshall and before that at her alma mater, Division II Glenville State, the 2022 Division II National Champions. She did win the Pat Summit Trophy 
as the D2 National Coach of the Year. So there is that connection. But maybe, Chantel, part of this is Tennessee in an era that has moved past Tennessee. You know, Gino Oremus managed to keep Connecticut relevant, but this has been a world now dominated by South Carolina and Iowa and now USC and UCLA and different names at the top of the women's college basketball ladder. Is Tennessee maybe saying it's time to get out of the Pat Summit era and create our own era that can rival or get back into the conversation with the programs that are dominating the game now? You know, maybe Kim Caldwell is going to come out and prove all of us wrong. They play, a, you know, her teams play an aggressive pressing style. They press off of like everything. And so maybe as Danny White is looking across college basketball and, you know, we saw it. West Virginia is a similar school that gave Iowa a ton of issues this year in the second round of the NCAA tournament, like these aggressive full court presses. We don't see them everywhere because they're really hard to play in. They're really exhausting. You talk to the players about the amount of conditioning that it takes to play in these programs um, and play in these systems. And and so, yeah, this might sort of be a 4D chess move where it's, you know, maybe it's not even that complicated that it's just like this feels like a way that you can win in the SEC. You know, they'll have 18 games to prove us wrong next season if that's the case. You can tell Kentucky's opinion of itself when you see on these lists that Dan Hurley is their number one. Uh, yeah, good luck. Good luck with that. Also, it's fun to see Billy Donovan on every coaching hire list uh, this year and and in per- perpetuity. I think the funniest would obviously be Rick Pitino if they brought him back at seventy one years old. Nate Oates, I think, is the one that they'll really go for and seems plausible. Or or Scott Drew. But I do wonder, will they kick the tires on uh, Becky Hammond? You know. That'd be fun. Probably not. Probably not. Chantel Jennings is the senior writer for The Athletic for the WNBA and women's college basketball. Go get some rest. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Up next, Sam Koppelman of Hunter Brook Media will join us to talk about Phoenix Suns owner Matt Ishbia. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase, every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch, subject to credit approval. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking, or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity, much like how their Progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip, cooking dinner, and even hitting the gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. A little more than a year ago, Phoenix Suns owner Robert Sarver, who'd been suspended by the NBA for, among other things, inequitable conduct to female employees and saying the N-word repeatedly, agreed to sell the team for an NBA record $4 billion. The new owner, Matt Ishbia, immediately authorized a trade for Kevin Durant and has since added Bradley Beal, making the Suns maybe the most win-now team in the league. But basketball isn't the only venue where Ishbia is obsessed with winning. He's also the CEO of United Wholesale Mortgage, which prides itself on being number one in its industry. 
ahead of Rocket Mortgage, whose CEO, Dan Gilbert, happens to own the Cleveland Cavaliers. Here's Ishbia in a leaked voicemail celebrating his mortgage dominance over Rocket Mortgage and Dan Gilbert in a rather salty way. Hey, buddy, hope you're doing good. Just want to say I love you. We fucking took those cocksuckers down. Fuck them. And we're going to keep fucking sticking it to them forever. Fuck those guys. We're number one. We take the shit out of them. Brokers are number one. UWM's number one. You're number one. We're all number one together. And fuck them. I fucking hate them with all my heart. And we're going to keep kicking their ass every fucking day. That's why I was here fucking at 4 a.m. again today. I don't give a fuck. Thank you, Matt Ishbia, for helping us earn the language warning this week. Uh, but the reason we're talking about all this is that a story published by Hunterbrook Media argues that Ishbia's company has cost its customers hundreds of millions of dollars by not, as it claims, helping them shop for the best mortgage deals. Joining us now is the publisher of Hunterbrook Media, Sam Koppelman. Sam, welcome. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, Sam, I just want to tell our listeners Hunterbrook Media is affiliated with a hedge fund, Hunterbrook Capital, that places trades based on the media company scoops. In this case, uh, the Hunter Brook Capital is short-selling Matt Ishbia's company as a result of the reporting that we're talking about today. That's all correct, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. We're going to get into that whole business model shortly, but first, let's just get our baseline facts down. What is United Wholesale Mortgage? United Wholesale Mortgage is the biggest mortgage lender in the country. They source 100% of mortgages through what they call independent mortgage brokers. And if you look at the company's advertisements, the way they describe independent mortgage brokers is these are local members of your community who go and advocate for you and go shop around and try to find you the best deal. And UWM claims they look through dozens of different options, come back to you and help you get get the best loan. What our reporting found is that there's thousands of these allegedly independent brokers around the country who actually send over 99% of business to United Wholesale Mortgage without disclosing their allegiance to Ishbia and UWM, to the home buyers who trust them. And what does that mean for customers? It means that at a very basic level, they're being lied to about what might be the single biggest purchase they ever make. So it's something that's very daunting buying a home. And this adds up to hundreds of millions of dollars you found cumulatively. And this is data reporting. It's based on public records, right? Like, can you just explain a little bit where this information is coming from? Essentially, there's all this publicly available data about mortgages that are filed that's filed at the federal level that explains essentially every mortgage in the country, who the lender was. And then there's a whole bunch of other data filed at county levels that say, uh, here's who the lender was, here's who the mortgage broker was, here's who the loan officer was, who actually got the person the deal. And if you combine those two data sets, you can figure out what the date was that the mortgage was closed, and you can figure out what people paid. And so what we tried to do was build a data analysis that compared as similar loans as we could. So loans that came from the same month, the same year, a 30-year conventional fixed rate mortgage with a 30-year conventional fixed rate mortgage. And one explanation that would have been great to find was that the reason people were sending Ishbia 99% of business was because they actually offered the cheapest rates. And what we found is that that wasn't true. They don't offer the cheapest rates even close to 99% of the time. And the data found that in general, they were actually more expensive than the other wholesale lenders that the brokers could have shopped with. So that's the nature of the data analysis. There's a 25-page write-up of it on our website, which is extremely dry and boring. But if you've got any wonky mortgage data nerd listeners, uh, would love any feedback. We are pretty upfront about the potential limitations of the data. Would love to make it better. And ultimately, in the end, your reporting estimates that borrowers paid United Wholesale Mortgage more than $200 million in closing costs over four years and around $900 million overall. Yeah, that's versus the what we constructed as essentially the average where you sort of control for interest rates, look at the same interest rate loans and figure out what the additional closing costs are. That's around the number we estimated was 800 over the over the country. We also compared UWM's loans to what we found this to be like, you know, sort of like the best available option if you were shopping between five different lenders. And that number was significantly higher. We did that comparison because that's how UWM advertises itself. 
And the wildest thing was within hours of our story coming out, multiple of the uh, advertisements of UWMs promising its brokers shop dozens of options in one and another that claimed it's had these local independent brokers, they just disappeared from UWM social media channels. They were gone, which isn't the best way to say that you're innocent. This is a sports story because Matt Ishbia's the CEO of this company and used the wealth accumulated from being from this company to buy the Phoenix Suns. It's also a sports story because Matt Ishbia was a walk-on for Michigan State basketball and uses his basketball career as kind of part of his legend, has Michigan State basketball uh, teammates as part of the company. But there's a third reason that this is a sports story, which is there's a connection between the Suns and between UWM, and that is the Hall of Famer Isaiah Thomas. What is the connection kind of tying the mortgage company and the Suns together with Isaiah Thomas? Isaiah Thomas, who was the president of the Knicks for several years of my childhood and is my only real bias in this story because I endured signing Jerome James. I endured Steve Francis, I think 80 years old coming to the Knicks. I just remember, I've been through a lot uh, as a Knicks fan, uh, especially during the the Isaiah era. But substantively, when I went to UWM's website as we were doing this investigation and checked out the board and I saw the first three members, Matt Ishbia, his dad Jeff, founded the company, his brother Justin, and I got to board member number four. Isaiah Thomas, famous for saying I met the criteria in The Last Dance, who, in my view, does not reasonably meet any criteria to be a board member of America's biggest mortgage lender. When I saw that, it definitely raised a few questions for me. And Isaiah Thomas also notably widely rumored to be involved in the Phoenix Suns front office decision making. His son is a member of basketball operations uh, at the Phoenix Suns, as Pablo Torre reported on his podcast. So Isaiah Thomas is intimately involved in making sure that your mortgage is on the level. And uh, I feel like the listeners of a podcast that's focused on sports might understand the gravity of that. So Isaiah was for a time listed as an independent board member, which implies some sort of outside oversight role on corporate boards. That was changed um, recently. That did change recently. He was listed in the 2022 filings as an independent board member. And then in 2023, they found other independent board members. But he's still on the board. And so he's still got some oversight over how this company's run. And just to give you a sense of the kind of company we're talking about here, it discloses that it uses company money to rent the family's private jet, company money to lease land from the family for office space, company money to hire the dad's law firm. So Isaiah Thomas is a board member. Ultimately, the shareholders get to decide if they're um, happy with how he's done. Um, But he's certainly not done a lot of holding the HBS in check, as far as I could tell. The other NBA connection Josh mentioned in the intro is that Dan Gilbert owns the Cleveland Cavaliers, and Gilbert's Rocket Mortgage Company is UWM's biggest rival. Dan Gilbert was the only NBA owner Uh, to not vote in favor of Matt Ishbia buying the Phoenix Suns. Does this matter in terms of NBA governance, in terms of the mortgage industry? And do your revelations and your reporting affect, do you think, the nature of the relationship between, A, these two teams and owners, and B, Matt Ishbia's relationship with the NBA going forward? I have no idea how the NBA makes decisions. What I can say is that Dan Gilbert, certainly not Ishbia's biggest fan. Ishbia, as you heard in that voicemail, certainly not Dan Gilbert's biggest fan. I mean, it's probably not like great in the owner's cafeteria, uh, especially after this week. When our story came out, Ishbia accused this of being a Dan Gilbert op of some kind, which I can confidently tell you it is not. Dan Gilbert and Rocket didn't even respond to our request for comment. Um, We couldn't get in touch with them and couldn't get any answers from them. But it's certainly the case that this appears to be close to a first for the NBA where two owners are in absolute conflict with each other. And Ishbia specifically in the mortgage sector, one of the ways he motivated these brokers to become 
loyal to him instead of truly independent was he banned any brokers working with him from sending any loans to Dan Gilbert's company, Rocket Mortgage. And so there's been a lot of legal back and forth on that point, and that's kind of not exactly the focus of our piece specifically, but those two guys definitely don't get along and definitely makes for a tricky way to run a league where they've got to all make decisions. But, you know, I'm a big fan of Adam Silvers, and I'm sure he's going to figure out how to maneuver his way around this one. So another thing that UWM said, and this was in response to a class action lawsuit that was filed um, in the aftermath of of your story, Um, a spokesperson for the company said, referring to Hunter Brook, that Hunter Brook's business model is to sensationalize public information to manipulate the stock market, thereby enriching their wealthy funders at the expense of regular investors, many of whom are hardworking UWM employees. Um, probably not how you would explain the Hunter Brook business model, but it seems like a good opportunity for us to transition. This is an unusual setup, first of its kind, would you say? Sure. All right. Yeah, well, I definitely haven't seen a company exactly like this before. So yes, happy to dive in and explain. We'll go with that. So there's a newsroom with a bunch of journalists, and they write up stories like this one, which we'll link to on our show page. And in response to that reporting, the affiliated hedge fund makes trades. And the allegation by this spokesperson is that this is sensationalism, that the incentive of the journalists or the journalistic outlet is to make this seem as bad as possible so that this, the stock price goes down. And to me, that doesn't seem like a crazy thing to allege. Like you will, the worse people think that UWM is, the more money the hedge fund will make, right? So here's how it works. The media company can inform the decisions of Hunterbrook Capital. Hunterbrook Capital has no say on the content or the timing of the work produced by the newsroom. And just to give you a sense of the people in the newsroom, even if Hunterbrook Capital were trying to do that, the people on the newsroom side would say, fuck off. I mean, the advisors on this team include the former editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal, founder of ProPublica, first public editor of the New York Times, really best-in-class folks, one of the bylines on this piece, William Cohan, he's a co-founder of Puck, an incredible financial journalist who's written for every major outlet, written important New York Times best-selling books. This is a really, really good group of folks coming together to do this. And we've also got independent fact-checkers we're working with, copy editors trying to do this right. The biggest incentive we have is to get stories done in a way where we have high degree of conviction that they're accurate, because if we're sending them over to Hunterbrook Capital and Hunterbrook Capital is taking a position in the market, we know that the next day, if there's something we didn't go chase down, a lead we didn't go chase down, the company is going to tell everyone the reason that what they did, what we say they did wasn't actually true. In this case, not only has UWM failed to prove wrong a single line in our article. The day the article came out, after we'd shared our data and research with a class action law firm, the law firm decided to go file a case accusing UWM of a RICO conspiracy, mail fraud, wire fraud between the company and its brokers. UWM, as I mentioned, deleted key advertisements where it promised its broker shop between dozens of options, even though our data found that they didn't. And HB had decided, instead of giving a specific rebuttal to what our reporting was, to allege a wild conspiracy theory that we were somehow working with Dan Gilbert, who I've never met and who would not respond to our request for comment. So baseline level, that's how it works. But we know this is novel. We know that it'll take time for people to trust what we do. And so for that reason, we don't just share what we know, we share how we know it. And that's why we've got that long, boring methodology on our website. It's why we'd love feedback. We try to be as upfront as possible, and we say exactly how we could profit on the side of the page. Um, and so people can, can read that and can have whatever opinions they want. And I don't expect to be trusted on day one. I expect to have to earn people's trust over time by doing really high quality work. 
one of the things that most people don't understand is the way that Wall Street firms gather information. They perform something akin to journalism, but it's not portrayed as journalism. Wall Street firms have gigantic research departments that they use to gather information in-house that they use to trade. The difference here seems to me to be that what Hunter Brook is doing is basically having a public media arm and taking information that otherwise would have been kept in-house, but packaging it as news, as conventional reporting, and having a bulwark of people like my former colleagues, Matt Murray and Paul Steiger from the Wall Street Journal, as advisors to lend you credibility. Is that fair? I don't think it's fair to say that it's to lend us credibility. These folks are involved in our work all the time. No, no, no. I mean to have credibility. I don't mean as a cover. I mean to create an actual journalism operation. So Totally. I mean, what we want to do is do this right. So we're trying to have the people who have actually been at the helm of some of the best publications in the world, the ones that we revere, help steer this reporting in the direction of it being really high quality stuff. And so, yes, a big part of the premise here is that there's really, really, really good information out there being kept behind walls that nobody ever gets to see. And so here we're going to publish it for free, no ads, no paywalls, and other people can vet it for themselves. That's the that's the bet. It's totally an experiment, though. I mean, no one's ever tried to do this. It might not work financially. It might not lead to the kind of impact that we hope for, ultimately. But what we've seen this week with just our first story is between UWN – uh, deleting those videos and the class action lawsuit that was filed and Ishtia having to resort to wild conspiracy theories. We feel confident that this is some good evidence that uh, this may be a way to produce really high quality work that can lead to some some impact. And so uh, we're going to keep going and, and keep trying to prove this out. Yeah, I guess I would say that the reason or a reason to put all of this stuff out publicly is because it helps drum up publicity, like us having this conversation here. And that if you do keep the information in-house, you're not maybe getting the news stories and the conversations and the opportunity to kind of trumpet this in a way that could benefit the, the hedge fund. And the reason to have all of these like great journalists and compliance people, I think, is that there is something fundamental fundamental here that is like antithetical to traditional mainstream journalism, where if you read a big in investigative story in The Times or something, you would imagine that there's kind of an impulse to moderation, that what are, what are all the arguments sure. from everyone? Let's bring in, why could we possibly be wrong about this? Here's some quotes from people who disagree. And the impulse of your story, which like you said, you put all this stuff out publicly. There's a method section. It's based on public data. And so the world or the market can check what you do. So it's not like you're just asking everyone just to trust you implicitly. But I don't think there's that same impulse towards moderation. You're building an argument or a case that you're right. And everything that you put out there is, I think, trying to point in that direction. I totally understand that question. And it's something that we're only going to be able to prove by doing high quality work. I'll say that internally, the way we view it is that we've got to get our stories right. As I mentioned, because if they're wrong, someone else will correct the record. Right. So I guess all I'm saying is like, there's nothing like inherent in the model to make anyone trust it. You just have to prove it to people. Exactly. Well, and, and, and I think the incentive- Don't you prove that also by just doing the kind of journalism that Josh just said? I mean, if Rocket Mortgage- and UWM had all gone on the record for you, I assume you would have printed reactions and interviews from everybody. I'll give you an example. So we reached out to UWM for comment. One of our questions was asking UWM to just send over a copy of the study it uses on its website to say that independent mortgage brokers save American home buyers $9,400. We couldn't find it on the internet. So we asked them to send it to us. We would have included how they did their study, we would have also used it to try to inform our study. And instead, they sent us a cease and desist and didn't engage with us. But yes, we want to reach out to companies for comment, and not just to companies. We want to talk to as many people as possible to check whether what we're saying is right, because Hunterberg Capital is going to invest money behind a lot of that reporting. 
And the business model only works if the stories are accurate. If they're wrong, no one will trust us going forward. And those positions aren't going to do very well. So we don't, we don't ask people to trust us. We ask people to trust the work, the people, and then also the incentives, which are towards getting it right. Though there are a lot of different ways that, of course, um, this could go wrong if we hadn't built the procedures and protocols and redundancies that we have. But it's totally reasonable questions, and it's the kind of thing that, as we've said, we'll, we'll only prove out with time. Sam, I'm just asking the questions Isaiah Thomas was asking as a UWM board member. So that's... that's so- I'm sure it's a similar <laughs> level of scrutiny. <laughs> Sam, we'll link to the story in our show page. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Thanks so much for having me. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. And now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. 50 years ago on Monday at 9.10 p.m. Eastern Time, broadcasting legend Vin Scully said these words. One ball and no strikes. Aaron waiting. The outfield deep and straight away. Fastball is a high drive into deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It is gone. moment for Atlanta and the state of Georgia. What a marvelous moment for the country and the world. A black man is getting a standing ovation in the deep south for breaking a record of an all-time baseball idol. Scully was calling the game in his job as the play-by-play announcer for the Los Angeles Dodgers. It was the bottom of the fourth inning on opening day at Atlanta's Fulton County Stadium. Aaron had been besieged by death threats and hate mail for months as he approached Ruth's record of 714 home runs. He walked in his first at bat against the Dodgers and before his turn at the plate in the fourth, told his teammate Dusty Baker, I'm going to get it over with right now. Al Downing threw the pitch. Braves reliever Tom House caught it in the bullpen. After his initial call, Scully is silent for 27 seconds as Aaron rounds the bases and fireworks explode. Dodgers first baseman Steve Garvey waves him around first. Second baseman Davey Lopes and shortstop Bill Russell shake his hand. Two idiot fans run on the field and pat Aaron on the back between second and third. Aaron's bodyguard would later say that he assessed the men as no threat and kept his gun holstered. Third baseman Ron Say stands there and watches. Here's a little more Scully. Aaron is being mobbed by photographers. He is holding his right hand high in the air, and for the first time in a long time, that poker face of Aaron shows the tremendous strain and relief of what it must have been like to live with for the past several months. 
It is over. It is over. I do remember watching the game, Josh. That's how old I am. There will be a bunch of ceremonies to commemorate the anniversary of Aaron's breaking Babe Ruth's record. Josh, what's your Henry Aaron? My Henry Aaron is also about race and baseball, coincidentally. I've mentioned before that my favorite newsletter is Pebble Hunting by our pal, the baseball writer, Sam Miller, who we've had uh, on the show a bunch of times, including most recently, I think, to talk about a piece he wrote on baseball pitchers killing birds or just baseballs killing birds. You should subscribe to Pebble Hunting and read Sam's most recent piece about the greatness of the annual Sports Illustrated baseball preview issue. It covers the history of SI. It covers a good chunk of baseball history, too, Sam's piece, including one episode that I didn't know about from 1955. Hey, one year, 1955. Uh, That year, the cover of the baseball preview, naturally enough, was devoted to the previous season's World Series champions, the New York Giants, uh, their star player, Willie Mays, and the team's manager, Leo DeRocher. And standing between them was the actress Lorraine Day, Leo DeRocher's wife. Day co-starred with John Wayne, Cary Grant, and Lana Turner in her career, but it was sports that made her a household name. As my old pal Robert Weintraub reports in his book The Victory Season, Day first met the famously ornery DeRocher in 1944, later telling the Associated Press, I didn't know who he was, but I certainly did dislike him. They later got reacquainted more happily, and they left her husband for the manager, getting divorced in Mexico so she could marry DeRocher. Although she was called a bigamist at the time, her reputation eventually recovered enough for her to become known as the First Lady of Baseball. It was a job she took quite seriously, attending every Giants home game and hosting a pregame TV show called Day with the Giants. In that same AP interview, she said, Before I married Leo, I wanted to win an Academy Award. Now all I want is for us to win a pennant. The Giants did win the pennant. The Giants win the pennant uh, and the World Series in 1954, thanks in large part to Willie Mays and his famous basket catch. And so there they all were. Willie, Leo, Lorraine, all smiles on the 1955 Sports Illustrated baseball preview, just eight months after SI started publishing. It's a really sweet photo. It was taken by SI's first staff photographer, Hy Peskin. Uh, Day's arms are around both men's shoulders. As James S. Hirsch uh, writes in his book, Willie May is the Life of the Legend, at this point in its history, SI stayed clear of social issues and didn't use its cover for any agenda beyond showing a good photograph. But this was 1955, the year that Emmett Till was lynched in Mississippi after a white woman claimed that he'd whistled at her. And by showing a white woman with her arm around a black man, Sports Illustrated had, it appears unintentionally, made a very big statement, one that its many racist readers were not pleased by. T.B. Kelso of Fort Worth, Texas, wrote in to say, Please cancel my subscription. This is an insult to every decent white woman everywhere. And A.C. Dunn of New Orleans wrote, Such disgusting racial propaganda is not fit for people who are trying to build a stronger nation based on racial integrity. Some letter writers did defend the magazine, with one from Jackson Heights, New York, saying that Mays, quote, waves no flags, stirs no trouble, and has no axes to grind. And Mays' biographer, James Hirsch, reports that the player himself thought the cover was cool and knew nothing of the controversy. But given that this was 1950s in America, it wasn't the last racist incident that Mays found himself caught up in. Two years later, when the Giants announced they were moving to San Francisco, Mays and his wife Marguerite bought a house in the city, only for the owner to back out because, quote, his business would suffer if it became known that he had sold a property to a black man. The owner eventually relented under pressure, and the Mays family moved in. Here's Mays reflecting on all of that in a 1957 TV interview. And uh, this, this, was this a disappointment to you and your wife to find this uh, trouble uh, that you've entered into for the past couple of days? Yes, it was a disappointment to me because I didn't figure that I would have this much trouble trying to buy a place. And that's why when I go looking for a house, I don't worry about who uh, living beside me. I go and try to find the best place that I like, like and I think I'll be comfy in. Two years later, someone threw a bottle through their window. That bottle had a note attached, which May said made reference to his race. That offseason, Willie and Marguerite decided not to make San Francisco their permanent home. Um, in the offseason, they lived in New York and just rented in San Francisco. Marguerite, Mays explained, 
We probably could have found a place around there somewhere, but I can't face another breaking in period to convince our neighbors that Willie and I are almost human. A few months after that, in June 1960, Lorraine Day and Leo DeRocher got divorced after 13 years of marriage. Day's New York Times obituary says that after they split up, Day told an interviewer that she had never liked baseball. And as for the Sports Illustrated baseball preview, after that controversial 1955 issue, Stefan, guess what SI had on its cover in 1956? A photograph of a baseball. <laughs> it's a pretty cool cover. The 1955 one, it really is amazing. Um, it's that old Sports Illustrated, the original Sports Illustrated typography with the big sports and illustrated in smaller type in a, in a sort of oval-shaped background beneath it. And they're staring at the camera indirectly. James Hirsch and the, and the Maze biography expresses with like some surprise, but I think it's kind of telling that the Northeastern liberals were like clueless about what this would mean. But, and I also think it's interesting. And the two letters that I read were only two of many, like they, they ran a lot of those kind of racist letters. And then the week Mm -hmm. following ran a a bunch of responses. Um, But again, like James Hirsch wrote, this was not a magazine that was interested in taking any kind of stance at that moment in its history. So I think after unintentionally wading into this or stoking this, the next year, there's a baseball on the cover. Did you find a good explanation for why SI put Lorraine Day between the two players? Was there a profile of her in the issue? I just think it's because she was really famous. famous. Yeah, and like associated with the the team in a way that I guess I hadn't really understood at the time. First Lady of Baseball. That is all for this episode. But a reminder, we've got a bonus episode posting on Tuesday about the men's national championship game between Purdue and UConn. To listen, subscribe to Slate Plus on Apple Podcasts by clicking Try Free at the top of our show page or visit slate.com slash hangout plus to get access wherever you listen. Our show notes are at slate.com slash hangup, and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. For Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zalmo Beatty, and thanks for listening. At Bet365, we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Whether it's a walk-off, grand slam, or a base hit to center field. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER.